Okay. So good afternoon. Thanks for coming back after the delicious food I understood you had over there. And uh, after enjoying the food in a physical sense, uh, I have the pleasure here to run this panel on some very interesting food for thought that we will have to appreciate and digest with some eminent uh, panelists here today with me. Uh, they will help us in discovering what's boiling out there in the world of the sustainable development in all its relations to environmental and uh, climate change risks and analysis, and also on how the role of uh, statistical offices could, could really play an interesting and maybe a leading role. That's a, an open question that we'll see later on today. But yes, we will need to have your help in understanding also the recipes of what is happening in, in the sustainable evidence for the sustainable <coughs> development. My name is Thomas Matraya, and uh, uh, I am the executive director of a multidisciplinary platform that works on sustainable development, connecting solutions for sustainable development. And uh, it's a non-profit. And I'm here today also as a, I think I enjoy the privilege of being a former UN colleague and a European Commission colleague, so I might have some interesting thoughts also to share with you. And this position allows me to be a little bit more open into that, if you allow me as well. Uh, what we're going to do is, uh, after having a quick introduction to the, of the panelists, uh, we will try to have a very frank and open discussion based on, on short and sharp and engaging, I think, inputs from your side. Uh, I would like this to be run as a, as a friendly and, and open talk, of course, so feel free to express your positions, uh, no matter how they might be sometimes uh, out maybe of the of the standard uh, approach, I think. Um, before introducing our panelists, I would simply make a reference to the keywords that today Mariana Kotseva mentioned. And I think uh, it is very useful for us to, to think about those words in order to, to plan our conversation. She mentioned uh, uh, concepts like new reality, new landscapes, not business as usual, new solutions, new approaches, but I would also like to mention what Stefan Ferlus mentioned and indicated today, the need for innovative partnerships, new modalities of data, collaborations, and uh, also tools like sentiment analysis, learning machines, tools to, inter to intercept uh, the dynamics of the current world. Uh, why I'm mentioning this? Because maybe sustainable evidence and sustainable development, and therefore sustainable development goals, might be a great opportunity for us to bring all these elements together, to start maybe rethinking the role of uh, or integrating the role and the activities of statistical offices. Without further ado, let me uh, quickly introduce you to our panelists. On my right-hand side, we have Malgosha Bartosik. I hope the pronunciation is good for several reasons. I'm of Polish, she is as well. I mean, she's full Polish, I, I understand. So. And Małgosia is the deputy CEO of Wine Europe. Uh, so she will be representing here, I think, the voice of private business, if you allow me in a more general term. And she will uh, share with us, of course, uh, what the, the impact of what she does and maybe the impact of what uh, statistics do also to, to her job, to her work on a daily basis, and maybe what, what is her own experience on, uh, on sustainable development and sustainable evidence. Then we have uh, Professor Giovannini. Uh, I think that uh, there would be no need for introduction to him, an eminent person that uh, has been working, uh, I think, almost all his life in this domain, uh, already former minister uh, the European uh, European government at the same time Professor, member of the Italian government, Italian government, and uh, full professor and member of the Club of Rome, um, and of course former chief statistician of the U.S. city. And uh, interestingly enough, but looking at his trajectory, maybe quite quite uh, evident also the fact that he uh, is currently the director, spokesperson as well of the Italian Association for uh, Promoting Sustainable Development. Then we have 
Chalina Viceva, thanks for joining us, Deputy Director of the Joint Research Center, already working on uh, several interesting issues uh, in relation uh, to growth, to sustainable growth in several areas, and coming from a very strong, I would say, national experience uh, in your own home country for several years. So she, she also helped us to understand how all the dynamics are seen from the European uh, Joint Research Center, but in general from the European perspective. And last but not least, Arno Behrens, uh, currently Senior Research Fellow at the SEPS, the Center for European Policy Studies, visiting professor at the Lewis University in Rome, and uh, also expert in SDGs and finance and environmental issues. Uh, we don't have, unfortunately, uh, Christoph Kaminker because he, uh, well, he's currently sick. We wish him a fast recovery, of course. Uh, it's a pity of not having him here today, but uh, we'll make sure that the inputs and the, the dynamics uh, on the panel are still uh, up to, to the standards that we, we planned even without an important person contribution as this is. Uh, Professor Giovanni, I would like to start with you maybe, and uh, I was reflecting today uh, on the fact that if we talk about sustainable develop development and we need to have sustainable evidence, there might be the need for a very, maybe str for a stronger and more uh, leading role of statistical offices, maybe in considering how to better promote and push forward the sustainable development in their daily work. This not only should be left maybe to the, to, the, to the actions of a single person, but should be somehow structured around uh, uh, the bodies, the bodies that work uh, with statistics on a daily basis. What's, what's your experience to that? Well, if you ask me whether statistical offices uh, should play a leading role on that, the answer is yes. If you ask me, are they playing uh, this role today? My answer is no, unfortunately not. Let me be extremely frank. Uh, um, my f one of the first projects that I had to deal with when I became chief statistician at the OECD was uh, on sustainable development. And in 2003, I proposed to the Conference of European Statisticians to establish an international task force on measuring sustainable development, 2003. And the answer was from statistical offices, no. This is outside of our boundary. This is just a political buzzword. This will disappear very soon. So we lost uh, years before the statistical offices jumped into this uh, new uh, framework. Fortunately, in, in 2005, we managed to have uh, uh, Eurostat, OECD, UNEC group working on this, so two publications that prepared the ground towards the possibility of having sustainable development as a driver of the post-2015 agenda. And when finally this happened, I have to say, notwithstanding the big efforts made by the international statistical system, after two years, we are far from playing a crucial, statistical offices are far from playing a crucial role in this respect. And I can tell you also based on my now experience as an activist, if you wish, trying to push the agenda for Italy. And I learned that I was wrong in supporting some of the ideas that we shared before. First, in Italy we have a lot of data uh, about SDGs, but they are in some cases, uh, not the most, uh, I would say, uh, timely data. And the unbalance that we have on very quick uh, economic data, a little bit uh, slower social data and uh, slower environmental data creates a bias on the entire discussion. But even if we had 240 indicators, could we really get something out of them? No way. This would be incredibly important uh, for policymakers focus on different topics, but not for the public, not for the politicians. This is why we have built 
for example, composite indicators, aggregating more than 100 indicators into 17. And we run, uh, let's say, uh, communication strategy on this. And this helps because you can get something out of 17 indicators. But, and then I stop, is this enough? No, because politicians want to talk about the future, not only about the past. And therefore, we have run a macroeconomic model extended to uh, environmental and social dimensions in order to do not only forecasts, but scenarios based on different policy. And that is something that is, I would say, attracting attention. So just to conclude, data could be better, much better. The presentation of the data must be done in a way that people can get something out of them. Third, even if you have all the data, timely data, that is not enough because you have to discuss about the future is what sustainable development is about. Margosha, I was thinking when that especially also like in indicators in relation to environment. You work in a, in a field that is rapidly changing. You have now companies like Google, Facebook also that are switching more and more to renewable energy. And uh, the experience and the connection that you have between the policymakers, the legislators, and the impact with the timeliness of the data that on which actually their decisions is based is crucial for businesses, but it's crucial for the environment as well. What's your experience on, on the, for instance, on the timeliness, on the capacity to work towards sustainable development with timely sustainable evidence data for policy making? How is in your daily life is this impacting your work and those of the, the companies you represent? Yes, I think the data is key, but, uh, but the time and the accuracy of the data is even more key. And uh, working for, for industry like, uh, like Winibus, uh, representing uh, the, the companies uh, active in wind, it's, it's so dynamic that uh, I don't think the data, is the, the data collection and the stati st statistical offices are really mirroring it and are, are at this moment are able to mirror it. And it is key because uh, we are, energy is a very, is, is very heavily regulated uh, um, sector and a lot of political, very dependent on the political decisions, and the political decisions are very dependent on the data, on, on the evidence that they have from statistical offices. Uh, just to give you, give you a couple of, uh, of statistics, uh, so wind energy at this moment, uh, the, today deliver more, uh, delivers more than 10% of uh, EU electricity demand. It's, uh, onshore wind is now the cheapest new power generation technology. Offshore wind, the cost of offshore wind has fallen uh, by 50% during the last two years. So it is not only about collecting the past data, but it's I think what you just mentioned about the scenarios and getting the scenarios right by working very closely with the industry and collecting the data directly from them through the open consultation process, which is not always happening, would be key to really get the picture right. And we had examples uh, in, uh, in uh, we had examples quite recently when uh, the, the scenarios were just not right because the data was not there. And it did uh, distort the picture for 2030 uh, scenarios and really downplayed the role of uh, off offshore wind in the future energy mix because of the lack of, uh, of uh, accurate and timely data. Quite, quite bold statements, I would, I would say. Um, that was not the brief to be uh, old and <laughs> to the point. Of course, it's, it's also yeah, power from statistics. It's, it's bold in itself in, in the definition. I would maybe like to ask uh, Jelena Viceva on, uh, on what's, what's the vision that the JRC has in uh, working on sustainable evidence and trying to... Can we have sustainable development if there is this gap between the data collection the way it is collected somehow, and uh, considering also that we are living in a changing and, and fluid world, if you want. You know, Zygmunt Bauman defined us also in terms of liquid modernity. There are, there are concepts, dynamics, that are moving really fast. So do we have, and what's the role of the statistical offices in intercepting those changes so, 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 so fast, so sharp, sometimes unpredictable? 
is a standard mission that we have to keep on having at the statistical office, or are we open, are we trying to experiment, or maybe to synergize and complement with the new modalities? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, actually, our mission is very close uh, to what Eurostat is doing because we are there to inform policies. And uh, the Joint Research Center is uh, uh, actually the science and knowledge uh, service of uh, the European Commission. Uh, the mission is there to support with independent evidence the policy cycles for each policy area, each policy initiative of uh, the European Commission. So it's, it's a high responsibility because um, uh, the evidence should be independent, it should be robust, it should uh, capture all the developments, the new realities, as uh, I understand Mariana mentioned this morning. Uh, so we are very much sharing with Eurostat uh, this uh, mission of providing data, uh, providing information for policymakers. Uh, but still we have different remit because we are very much science-based, so we do more with data, we go much more into the analysis, we, uh, uh, do research on the basis of uh, data, and uh, we know very, very well the value of the good quality of data because uh, everybody knows in a model, uh, rubbish in, rubbish out. So if you don't have good data that uh, uh, you design uh, and you, you might design the best model in the world, it, it will not going to produce uh, the, the designed uh, uh, outcome. So uh, we are very much close as mission but uh, we still have our differences. And the only way of not overlapping with each other is to cooperate. And we cooperate very, very heavily with uh, Eurostat on a number of uh, areas. Uh, now, what uh, we recently started doing is uh, not only knowledge production, but really concentrate uh, much more on knowledge management and information management. And you mentioned also making sense out of what is out there because um, uh, if we are talking about new realities, part of the new realities is that we have dilute of information. And having too much information is almost equal as not having information and data because uh, the huge amount of data makes the data and information less accessible. So the idea behind for our mission uh, now, because you were mentioning the new realities and how we are evolving, uh, is uh, uh, really to manage uh, knowledge, not only the one that we produce and the research we produce, but also all available uh, globally, sometimes uh, knowledge, and uh, collect it, analyze it, and make sense out of it so that it becomes readily, immediately, and timely available to policymakers. Talking about uh, future scenarios, we, uh, as a scientific organization, have to understand quite well that the policy cycle and the research cycles are different. The research cycle takes much more time. The policy cycle can be really anticipated uh, with days, uh, taking uh, up new priorities and new decisions. So in order to bridge the gap, because we are there to serve with our research, the policy makers, we need to be much more anticipatory. So we are working with a lot of simulations, modeling, uh, trying, uh, putting sensors uh, everywhere uh, in, in our areas in order to grasp uh, the new developments and uh, produce the research that might be necessary for future priorities. So uh, anticipatory uh, approach, knowledge management approach, uh, working with the new realities of new data, for, for example, with uh, Eurostat we are doing a lot on how to use big data. Uh, I think that uh, Eurostat, although, and this, I, I don't want to qualify and to put labels, but normally statistical offices are considered very conservative uh, because they want to be long-term uh, and quite uh, stable in uh, having a, a continuity in, in their time series. But um, it is obvious that we can't skip but reap the benefits of the uh, a uh, huge amount of data there from big data, from uh, satellite images that are ever more accessible and so on. So uh, all that we have to put into the picture in order to provide to provide the knowledge that is needed for our, our policy makers. Thanks. Arno, I was thinking, uh, I mean, Europe is committed, especially when it comes to environmental issues, uh, to contribute and to lead 
contributions to the Sustainable Development Goals. Now, after having heard a little bit these scenarios, working at the SAPS, what, what's the pulse of the situation here? Like, do you feel that there is, there is the need for maybe a more specific role for statistical offices and, and really take this as a priority and move it, move it up in the value chain? Or this should be considered business as usual? apart from the, the political commitment that then has to be translated in, in concrete actions on a daily basis. Do you see this being matched or there is room for improvement or things are not so linear? Well, well, thank you, Thomas, and uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I've been working on sustainable development also qu quite some years, and um, I think what you're saying is that um, indicators are very important to, to measure this groundbreaking change that we're, we're seeing now with the um, SDGs having been agreed uh, not just for developing countries but also for the European Union. So this is really a groundbreaking change. Um, it should be on top of the political agenda. I have a feeling it is not yet. And this is also reflected in the, in the indicators that um, are being presented. We have this EU indicator set, um, but in my view um, there are some, some, some some key problems with it, and one of them has been mentioned, it's the timeliness of the data. When I was presenting, when I was writing my paper for the Outlook report um, in June, basically I was checking, um, uh, you know, when the last data for GDP was available, and that was quarter one of 2017. The last data for DMC, that's basically material consumption in the EU, was available for 2015, so that's two years back. Now, if you consider, and, and I'm talking about circular economy because I'm, I'm working on this quite a bit, if you consider that the headline indicator of the resource efficiency scoreboard, the headline indicator, is um, basically GDP divided by DMC, so the amount of uh, 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 the value produced by each ton or, or unit of, of material used, then this means for policymakers that they are handling with data that's two years old. Um, so when I look at the mission statement of Eurostat, um, it says, first of all, to provide reliable and objective data. I think we can say that <coughs> is, is happening. And the second point is to give an accurate picture of contemporary society and to evaluate the performance of politicians and others. And I think on that second point, at the moment, we're failing because we do not have the data available um, to support this. Um, and I think it's a political issue. If we take sustainable development as what it is, as the prime target of, of, of uh, you know, the development of our society um, in terms of the environment, in terms of social values, in terms of the economy, then we also need to have uh, indicators comparable to GDP to mirror this. Um, so maybe this would be a first step. Thanks. Margosha, I was just thinking if you had any reaction on, on, the time, on the timeliness, of course, and how do you deal with production of data in Europe? I mean, maybe you can also tell us how this is done in-house and uh, if you found maybe uh, your recipe to, to try to merge the timeliness with the accuracy, etc. Yes, we, we collect a lot of data internally. So we, have, uh, we, we would have at, um, at least five different reports a year. And we have uh, one which is the, the annual statistics that we are quite proud of because it's a report that uh, gives you the full picture of the wind industry for the year uh, before, one month and a half after. So in February, we would normally launch an annual statistics, a report that with all data collected in 2016. So this, this, is, this is, if we're talking about uh, timely and accurate data, this is something very timely and very accurate and uh, providing, uh, providing uh, evidence for our members, for the policymakers uh, to, to, to get really the right, uh, the right picture. So we, the other example that, uh, that uh, I would like to mention here, just uh, starting with, uh, with a negative uh, <laughs> case, I would like to, to also mention something very positive. So thanks to the, sorry, thanks to the EU regulation on uh, transparency um, uh, of, the, of the electricity data, we were able to, to develop a daily wind tool, uh, which is uh, basically giving, uh, it is on the website and it, and it gives uh, a picture of, uh, of the share of wind in electricity mix mm -hmm. the day before. 
And it's something that, uh, that we've, that we've it's, it's, it's actually it's my colleague who's sitting just over there in the audience who put that together. So it's an in-house development. It's, uh, we, since we've launched it this year, we, have, we had 200,000 views on, uh, on that, uh, of that platform. And we are actually, it was done on a request from people from the European Commission. They said that they do receive something similar from, from, from other trade bodies. And, uh, and it was, uh, and it, it really changed the, the, the picture. It was basically on daily basis, they receive their inbox in the morning. There's 2,000 people in Brussels and around, uh, and around the, the world that receives, uh, that receives a very short email showing to, uh, yesterday's uh, mix of, uh, of, uh, of electricity. So in, in the EU. So we are able, and we are able to collect this data thanks to, to EU regulation that, uh, that requires this transparency on, on, uh, on the transmission system operators. Developing on, on also on sustainable development, it's another key topic is also the, the resilience. The resilience as a, well, we have here by definition, different definitions of resilience. Somehow the UN goes for a specific definition, the EU on another. So it starts already being sometimes a little bit uh, problematic in terms of finding the right tune. But maybe this is actually the reason for which one should uh, start considering also this topic as a specific topic within the sustainable development, Professor Giovannini. Yeah, before answering your uh Second question, let me just say one word about uh, the, how the timely data can change the picture. A few days ago, uh, a research institute in Italy uh, published the data on CO2 emissions for the first semester of 2017, which shows an increase of CO2 emissions higher than the increase in GDP. Why? Because the absence of rain blocked the uh, electric uh, power based on water. And therefore, the share of renewables went down. And well, that attracted a lot of attention because it was talking about 2017. So I fully agree with you that uh, timeliness can change the discussion. Of course, you have to make some estimates. and. Uh, one of the big challenges of the SDGs is that uh, you may have a negative relationships or positive relationships between the different SDGs, and this makes the whole picture quite complicated. It's, it's where you need models. Similarly, you need models uh, to evaluate resilience. With the J JRC and the EPSC, uh, we are running a project uh, which involves the different uh, DGs of the Commission in order to try to understand how to measure resilience. We published the first uh, report in July. You can find it in the JRC website, where we try to merge the different definitions of resilience used in different DGs. And try also to build a, a general model on uh, how to treat resilience. Normally, resilience is seen there's a capacity of uh, a person, of a material, of a society, and so on, to go back after receiving a shock, to go back to where it was before the shock. We are trying to make this evolving. Instead of talking about bouncing back, we are talking about bounce, bouncing forward. Why? Because if you are on a sustainable path, you want to go back to the original path. But if you are not on a sustainable path, you want to use the crisis in order to reach a different path towards sustainability. So what we are trying to do now is to measure, to identify resilience indicators. But to do that, uh, uh, we don't need simply to collect data. We need to build models, analytical models. Tomorrow at the EPSC conference here in Brussels, I will show some very preliminary uh, results uh, achieved by the JRC team, which makes clear that uh, if you want to talk about economic resilience, just economic resilience, you can uh, reach some conclusions about, for example, the different uh, resilience uh, capacity of countries but then uh, when you expand uh, the analysis to look into the social resilience, 
the picture changes. Because some countries that look very resilient in terms of economic variables may be much less resilient in social dimensions and vice versa. And as SDGs are talking about the overall picture of a country, of a region, of a continent, this is why the resilience uh, model can help in understanding uh, as shocks will come, how much we are prepared, but also how much we are ready to react in the right way. And let me just conclude on this point that this is not easy, uh, an easy sell on a, from a political point of view. Because building a political resilience, uh, a political narrative on resilience, obliges people to say we are going to face uh, shocks. And this mes can be a scaring message, but it's the reality. The fact that now hurricanes are hitting uh, not only uh, Florida, but even uh, Portugal, Spain, uh, Ireland, and so on, shows how tricky and bumpy will be the future. So this is why we need models, and it's great that you can monitor some phenomena in a so timely way. From an environmental point of view, the use of sensors allows you to trace almost everything, a lot of things in real time. The slowest part of the game is the social part. And I would like uh, to thank Eurostat for publishing recently what they called experimental statistics uh, on indicators on share of population in poverty or social exclusion and so on. Now we have data for 2016, which is a one year more than what we are normally used to, to, to have. So it's, of course, a problem of resources, but it's also a problem of mindset. This is where statistical offices need to speed up this transition. Maybe because my first job was to calculate, at the Italian statistical office, was to calculate the quarterly GDP. <laughs> and once you have done it, you can calculate everything in, in your <laughs> life. But uh, uh, it's true that uh, it's mainly an issue of mindset, of course, precision. Accuracy must be preserved. But uh, modeling, uh, using modeling, uh, uh, shouldn't be seen uh, as, uh, as only a risk. Maybe some risks, but today, okay. if you want to be relevant, you must do it. Thank you very much. I see that maybe Magosha might want to have yes, a yeah, quick, quick reply, please. Thank you. Uh, I think it's, uh, we, we've just uh, highlighted some, some key words here, the, the, the timing of the data, the accuracy of the data, the mindset, and also you've mentioned the, the, co the collaboration. And uh, if I understand right, we're talking a lot about the collaboration between uh, different statistical offices, be between GRC and Eurostat, and I think it is key to really open it up more to the business side. So I think that the corporates now, for, they play a key role in sustainable development. They also play a key role in data collection. They all have a huge, they, they have their own methodologies, the ways to collect data very quickly. And, uh, and of course, the data needs to be objective and needs to be collected in a, in a very neutral, uh, collected and presented in a very neutral way. But still, I think that uh, some sort of a, a consultancy, open consultancy process is there. They are, so one <laughs> thing is whether they are ready, the other thing is are they being asked to share it or are they being told to share it? And uh, there is, uh, the, the for sharing the data and transparency, there's a great case with, uh, with power purchase agreements, for example, with, uh, with the corporates in now, uh, that's just it. that was supposed to be your third question, I think, about the role of well, business. Well, it's, it's a free debate, so we can <laughs> anticipate things and so project I, I, as well. <laughs> If I may, there is uh, the, the corporates uh, are going green. They, and they were, uh, even, even two years ago, you, the, it was seen much more as a, as a CSR, CSR kind of a greenwashing, if I may, uh, effort. And, uh, and now, because of the data transparency mm -hmm. and also because of the, of the cost of renewables uh, going, uh, going so quickly down, it's, uh, it's, it's an, it makes economic sense uh, for them. For the purchase power agreements is all the stories that you read on daily basis about uh, half of KitKat is made, made with, uh, with wind, about Nestle, Mars, uh, Google, Facebook, uh, powering the 
their operations with green, green power. So they are sharing the data, they are proud of it, they, are make, they, they see that, the, that it's not on, it not only benefits their customers, but also their, their, their investors, their state, uh, shareholders. Uh, so, and because they are sharing it, they're sharing their stories, they're sharing the data, they are, they are bringing others on board. So the, in, since, two, since two years, uh, the number of those PPAs, those power purchase agreements, triples. It's still, in Europe, it's still quite a, quite a small amount of the big, rather big uh, corporates, uh, but it's, uh, it's moving very quickly and it will be key uh, in, in sustainable development. The role of corporates combining the, the, the sustainable effort and the CSR uh, of, the, of the corporate with business model that, uh, that, that basically makes economic sense for them. We will go on transparency also later on as well, but it's, I think it's, it's very valuable that you mention uh, this right now because one of the elements also of the SDGs is, is the partnership, of course, the creation of specific ad hoc innovative partnership. So here I would like to go very briefly also to, to Charlene Viceva and to see how is, is this partnership already happening apart from what you said or do you have something also, you know, like coming up that might be able to be even more concrete or producing even more results that could help to position Europe, of course, at the global stage as one of the main contributors to sustainable development. And how you see also, you know, this, this growing trend in terms of uh, having a cooperation or partnership with the private sector through different type of modalities, of course, and the, if you want, maybe a standard type of position of official um, statistical offices here. Yeah, thank you very much. Just to say we are not a statistical office. We no, work yeah, a lot with not, data, we generate data, but uh, we of course use uh, heavily the statistical data. Directly to your question or maybe statement about using the data provided by the private sector. We are very much open to that and I will give you immediately an example. Uh, the Renewable Energies uh, Directive, which is uh, now being proposed uh, for amendment we were um, uh, participating very heavily in the impact assessment as the Joint Research Center, and we were collecting all the data, all the data that were made available by the industry, uh, for, for example, for the first um, uh, generation uh, uh, biofuels. We've been integrating them into the survey, so we factor them in. So the real question here is that whenever you offer uh, your data, we have to be sure that they are consistent with everything else. Because we, talk, we should talk about the same definitions, about com uh, compare, uh, comparability of data and all that. So, and uh, also what is very important is um, that we have prudent approach to data, not picking evidence. For us, it is crucial to be independent and not allowing picking evidence but giving the full picture. So from this point of view, we take everything that comes uh, because we are uh, on a transparency uh, wave, but uh, we have to be clear that we need consistent, coherent, and well-based uh, and defined uh, data coming from, uh, from the sector. And we don't always get everything that uh, uh, will complete the time series. Now, with regard to sustainable development, we do a lot in the Joint Research Center. Now, uh, uh, with the um, SDGs, we are trying uh, to establish, uh, together with all the directorates general, because it's a common endeavor, to have uh, an assessment framework uh, based on, uh, uh, on uh, uh, indicators. So we have the indicators um, within, within the, the Committee Sustainable Development Goals, but we have to see how we can really project the impacts from various policies uh, on the various uh, uh, sustainable development goals. And what we are trying to establish now are methodologies for trade-offs between policy areas with regard to, to the SDGs. Because as uh, Professor Giovannini said, uh, it's not, there is no need to discover. It, uh, several facts can immediately uh, show that various policies, they really have counter interests when you place them at the level of uh, one or more SDGs. So for us as uh, policymakers, as uh, commission, it is really important to factor into the policy making uh, ex ante the mm -hmm. expected impacts of each and every policy area on uh, the um, uh, implementation, on the sustainability, on the sustainability indicators. So this is what we're trying to do now as something really new, the methodologies 
of discovering the trade-offs between policies with regards to uh, SDGs. And we deal, do a lot of other things. Uh, just take the, the environmental footprint. So that was something that we've been working already for more than 15 years, uh, at least more than 10 years. Uh, these are um, uh, composite systemic approaches to, to um, uh, environmental sustainability or sustainability in general. So we are really uh, all just take the national accounts and the environmental accounts. So these are all things that have been uh, uh, designed or co-designed with the Joint Research Center. On the resilience, if you allow me, or we will cover it later. Indeed, it is a, a very nice project that started uh, more than one year ago. And uh, resilience, which is important, is that resilience is centered on welfare. So in the end, what we want to, to, to see, to what extent um, the various entities, individuals or entities, uh, can dynamically respond to shocks so that at the end we have the welfare effect not changed or improved. So uh, the difficulty here, however, is that uh, if we want, that's why we use the models, is that we can't test all the time the system because the shocks are not there all the time and we shouldn't produce shocks just to test the system. So that's why... Uh, we were lucky because <laughs> we had a big shock uh, yes. over the last few years. Yes, this is where we are testing... Yes, uh, yes indeed. You're not it planning to clinically prepare it, right? <laughs> uh, yes, and uh, uh, actually uh, resilience, maybe just to add something which I consider very, very important. Indeed, we have various aspects. Now, why are we um, waiting? Uh, social, we brave economic, social, very important to pick up on uh, link that. to education, environmental uh, as well. Professor Chen, please. Well, machine learning uh, is about uh, learning from data and uh, establishing connections uh, uh, among data. Uh, this is, in a sense, is a tautology, but it's something that for sure statistical offices are not yet applying because they normally do not deal with uh, the massive data that uh, come from big data because they tend, and rightly so, to aggregate, to produce aggregated figures instead of uh, looking at uh, individuals' behaviors and identifying patterns and so on and so forth. That is where, I don't know, I agree that normally statistical offices don't do forecasts. Italy is one, France are the only two excep exceptions, I think, in Europe. But the point is that uh, if you want to identify connections between different phenomena, machine learning uh, can help uh, in identifying, uh, in providing answers to questions that could be given by statistical offices. What I'm trying to say is that if the role of statistical offices is not only to produce numbers, that is to produce knowledge. Knowledge can be produced also using microdata, big data, and many other things that do not necessarily fall into the category of uh, aggregate statistics. This is why I believe uh, that the future of statistical offices is really the management of knowledge together in cooperation with experts uh, who are used to do these kind of things, but the knowledge that the society provides. This is why, in my personal view, is in future statistical offices need to change the strategic positioning uh, in uh, the modern societies. Because others, otherwise, will produce aggregate figures and they will crowd out statistical offices. So there is maybe also the, the way to see statistical offices as kind of you know, new committed uh, intellectuals in society. I mean, I don't want to go for Jean-Paul Sartre and the role of intellectuals in the society, but statistical offices should definitely, considering how to complement and integrate and synergize with different type of, uh, of techniques of models, and then to see whether there might be the need, as it has been said this morning, of having new professions like the data steward, for instance, uh, new professions coming up that could be the bridge, I don't know, could be hybrid, could be something that actually is helping statistical offices themselves, but also society and policymakers and society at large. 
So this is really uh, an interesting topic. Uh, I would uh, like to see whether we could have also now the results of, uh, of what he had uh, so far to see also what people in, in this room think and also what people uh, outside uh, told us. So, well, it's quite 57%. Yes, statistical offices should strive to move up the value chain in relation, of course, to sustainable development social, economic, and environmental developments. Yes, but only within a politically agreed framework. So some, someone captured that little nuance that has been passed uh, before. No, this falls outside the remit of statistical offices. What, 23% and what, zero on no other reason. Do you agree on that? Or do you agree on anything of that? Arne. I, I just, I just basically gave the answer to this question. Of, in, in my view, I, I would agree with the 23% that say no, this falls outside of the remit of statistical offices, although I do agree the points uh, that uh, Enrico mentioned. So it's, uh, Can we have the results still on, please? Ah, oh, no, please keep, keep on, keep on. Dude, it's, it's done, okay. But I, but I didn't vote. <laughs> you didn't vote, okay, so you're not represented. <laughs> All right, I think if uh, there is no other reaction on that, we'll, please, Charlene. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm risking because I'm not a statistician, but uh, uh, I, I would rather go for the second category. Uh, the, the, the firm yes, uh, I'm sure it comes because we have so much data now, and someone uh, that has the knowledge of how to operate with data, and normally professionals, statisticians are professionals on that, should take care of it. So, but then uh, I understand that the mission should be very, very clear. So that's why I'm going for the second category, mm -hmm. because we need to know who does what and for what sake. So uh, once that is clear, I think statistical offices maybe can come out of their regularized, long established for many years function and just face the new reality. Just see that there is much more data that is probably not validated but it ensures uh, granularity, it ensures, uh, uh, com uh, ensures um, uh, timeliness. So the idea there is that the data specialist should make sense out of all that, of this data, and ensure that they are interpreted in the, and used in the best possible way. So this is for me the ideal and optimal, but whether we have the capacity to do that, for example, in Eurostat, this is for Mariana to say. I'm not capable of saying. We have an interesting question that needs to be passed to Mariana later on. Okay, thank you so much so far. Um, it has been mentioned before, like, in relation to the transparency, that, you know, for corporations or also in relation to, to climate risks, you know, how this information should be used. There are different approaches uh, out there. One, uh, if you want, is a little bit more like the stick, so to say, because it's the, the naming and blaming one. You know, you can have different uh, multinationals or companies that might not be so compliant with specific uh, regulations or like the, the code of conduct when it comes to, to environmental uh, issues is not that, well, that, that terrific in terms of uh, the capacity they, 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 they have and how much they're engaged. Actually, this morning when I, when I woke up, it was quite interesting to see, you know, like also what, uh, how this impacts on our daily life uh, in the hotel. I'm just, I'm just reading. If you, if, you don't, if you don't want to have uh, uh, anyone coming to clean your room on a daily basis, you're actually rewarded. You're rewarded. You're rewarded in different ways. You can have specific points if you... Uh, keep on going to the same chain of hotels, or you might have uh, uh, a voucher, a specific credit. And uh, the final message is, if you decline housekeeping services and help us conserve natural resources, you're doing a great action. Now, this is maybe at the end of the whole uh, process, but that's what people out there most likely understand. So there, there is a reward. There might be a naming and shaming. Uh, how do you see that, Nagosha? I think that private sector feels very much part of the problem, but also part of the solution. And uh, I think that they, because, of, because they think that they are part of the solution, they also feel comfortable sharing more and more data. 
because it makes them proud. It just makes them proud of the, what they do, like uh, the, the hotel example, but also many corporates, uh, what, I've just, uh, what I've just mentioned before about the power purchase agreement. So they are proud of it. They feel like they are doing something to, uh, to make this world more sustainable. And uh, they're fully aware of the, of the climate change and they know that, they're, they're, that they need to, that they are part of it and they need to do something uh, to, to make the, their operation more sustainable. And they feel that they're also rewarded uh, by their customers and their shareholders. So you see also that, that this trend of, uh, of greening the, the, the operations of the, of the big corporates is very much appreciated by the, by the customers. So it's, it's, it's not only top down, but there's also very much of a bottom up approach. And I think that's a window of opportunity. If you want the companies to share more data, I think that's really the, 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 the moment to ask them to, to, for, for data. Mm, if I can just go back uh, to, to the question of, uh, of, uh, of the previous question on data, I think it is the new reality also that there is so much data and also such an easy access to data. So everyone can basically make their own opinions on what they see on, by, on Wikipedia, what they can Google. So I think that, the, that it's very important that, uh, that collecting data is part of a bigger project with a bigger purpose, that we know what we want, uh, why we want to collect this data, why we want to use this data, and therefore the, the, the role of the statistical officers could be maybe, I think it's key to filter that data because there's so much out there with such an easy access for everyone to, 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 to get the information and make their own opinions. I don't know if this could also be linked to transparency somehow, internal transparency and filtering of data. Those are two, I think, sometimes sensitive and delicate issues depending on the perspective that you want. Um, Arno, I think you wanted to, to enter into that as well. Yes. Um, I. I mean, it's not about naming and shaming, I think, anymore. Maybe it mm -hmm. used to be like that. Now it's about peer pressure from regulation and from shareholders, co consumers, and so on. So more and more companies are actually, you know, presenting some kind of indicators in their sustainability reporting. And uh, there are various flame frameworks on the global level. You have, I don't know, the, the UN Global Compact, the, the um, uh, Global Reporting Initiative and others. On the EU level, of course, you have the EU Directive on uh, the Disclosure of Non-Financial and Diversity Information. So as of next year, some 6,000 companies will actually report on environmental data, um, basically about 2017. Um, but then you also have very strong legislation on the national level. In France, for example, um, there are very strict CSR reporting requirements in the uh, French Code of Commercial Law. Uh, from waste prevention to sustainable use of natural resources, energy use, and so on. So large companies have to report on this already. Um, but that is also part of the problem, because if, um, if you ask you know, whether this can be used for official statistics, then the problem is that currently, well, it's only large companies, basically with more than 500 employees. What's excluded at the moment completely is SMEs, SMEs are 99% of the businesses in Europe. They provide two out of three jobs in the EU, and they're not at all included in this. Not only because uh, they're not included, but also because they cannot provide the data in many instances, because SMEs, as you know, have some specific limitations. And, uh, and finally, um, there's no agreed framework for the indicators presented by companies. So the, comp the, the indicators vary, they cannot be aggregated. Um, the Commission has published its, uh, its uh, non-binding framework, non-binding guidelines, but as the name suggests, they're non-binding, and they're not very precise and very detailed on what kind of indicators to use, what kind of methodologies to use, and so on. So there's still um, a lot of work to do in this area, I think, in order to, to use company data, which can be very timely, as, as we discussed before, uh, but on the, on the kind of higher level on the, of the statistical offices. The yeah, question, English. of course, is uh, as there is a lot of work to be done, who is going to do it? The question is, of course, legislators and so on who will work on this. But uh, uh, in Italy, in Netherlands, there were already attempts to work with GRI in order to link the, their indicators with uh, the statistical indicators. I'm not aware of uh, more recent uh, developments, but 
Is Eurostat uh, working on this? Is Eurostat, in a sense, trying to create a standard that can help legislators uh, to fix uh, a better standard later or to have a stricter standard? Because now analysts are screaming because uh, this easy, easiness of reporting is not helping them. I was two days ago in a conference in Rome where a big uh, oil company was criticizing, as we had criticized the government, in the way in which the directive has been implemented because it's too vague, while analysts want to be very precise. So they will be obliged to report twice, one for the useless, let's say, or less useful uh, legal obligations and one for the analysts. The fact that uh, the market is moving so quickly means that uh, the push for standardization will be much higher than the next few years. Maybe you can confirm this or not. And this is a great opportunity for statistical offices. Then you say rightly that uh, small and medium enterprises are not covered, but we saw in our experience with GRI that just few indicators could be embedded in the ongoing uh, annual surveys run by national statistical offices, also on uh, large or medium and uh, small enterprises. Not everything should be reported. And this would contribute to the peer pressure that you was talking about. Is this outside the boundary of official statistics? Now, I started my first intervention saying that this concept of boundary of official statistics is beep, okay? <laughs> it changes over time. It's normal because statistical offices have to respond to evolving questions from the society. Of course, they have to stick to professional and scientific methods. And in some cases, they have to say, we don't know, we are not able to answer your question yet. I'm not saying this is not an issue that we should deal with. And sustainable development is a dramatic case of a huge mistake because, as I said, we lost years instead of being ahead of the curve. Of course, this requires leadership. This requires also a group of politicians or policymakers who ask statistical offices to go in this direction. But the private sector, I agree with you, can be a huge, strong ally in this. And this is maybe an area where the stakeholders uh, should make uh, their voice clearer and stronger at European and also at national level, asking statistical offices to go quicker in this direction. If I may be for passing the floor to, to Charlina, um, giving the floor also to some of, our, some of our followers that is actually making maybe a nice, interesting bridge. And uh, Rader Macher is asking us how to support deliberate and participative politics with SD indicators. In this case, I mean, we have a political component, a social component, if you allow me, a technical component of the capacity and understanding of the role of who is the person no, or the institution that needs to, to work on that. How can we triangulate or how can we find maybe new configuration in order not to lose time no more? Because maybe we have lost already too much in that case. Shadi. Uh, yeah, thank you. It's a very interesting question. Uh, we haven't been talking uh, uh, yet about the life cycle approach in uh, measuring uh, environmental impact. But uh, this is really the systematic approach to to, to, to assess fully the environmental projections of, of a product, for example, or a process. And if we consider the life cycle, then one of the most important uh, parts of the life cycle is production. So corporate, not just corporate transparency, corporate responsibility is crucial. And if we're talking about peer, peer pressure, this, is, this comes from, uh, um, for competition reasons. But I think that we have to talk also about societal pressure. And uh, equally like labeling um, animal welfare, fair trade, and other labels that come from public demand, uh, 
Equally, it is important to label the environmental uh, impact uh, um, positive practices on the product so that our society exerts, has the transparency to exert its, its pressure. So I think uh, things are really very much linked. But I would like to mention something that um, the Commission is doing with regards to uh, the trans corporate transparency in this respect, and this is the so-called uh, eco-management and audit system, the so-called EMAS, uh, which indeed is voluntary because with the industry we, are, we have a cautious approach of where and how much we can step in. Uh, it's very close to um, uh, uh, the ISO um, uh, 14001 uh, environmental certification, but the only additional thing is transparency. And this is the most important element of this system. It, this transparency uh, element uh, provides us with uh, the information that now we have close to 4,000 organizations that cover more than 9,000 sites uh, Emma, Emma's registered. So this is huge amount of information because uh, this, this, is a, uh, uh, this is a tool to evaluate and report and improve the climate and environmental performance. So it is performance based and we have to use this information uh, prudently and nicely um, uh, in, in the life cycle uh, impact assessment in general. Because, uh, and we shouldn't forget also consumption there. So consumption uh, with what you started depends on uh, citizens. We have also industrial consumption and uh, we have uh, um, production as part of the life cycle for which the, the corporate uh, business community is responsible. So we, we, we need a lot to, to, to share, cooperate, and we need the partnership, genuine partnership. If there is no immediate reaction to that, I would like now to... Can yeah, I just to say one word, mm -hmm. because uh, also this uh, refers to the work of JFC. Um, Walter is right uh, in saying that uh, this kind of data could stimulate uh, uh, the participation from citizens. Mm -hmm. This morning we heard about uh, the citizens generated data, mm -hmm. which is uh, a new way of collecting uh, information that needs some treatment, otherwise, of course, they have uh, all the biases that we know. But one of the key points is that uh, one of the key challenges of the SDGs is to localize them is to make them uh, applied uh, to relatively small communities. And the uh, first uh, type of community that comes to my mind is uh, the city level. And so the JRC has developed uh, a city database for uh, European cities, which has a lot of data that could be linked to SDGs. But of course, you need more data and more timely data. But the point is that uh, uh, we already made this discussion uh, a few months ago that uh, the way in which you present data must be aligned to SDGs. And otherwise we follow the old, uh, let's say, uh, classifications and doesn't trigger the connection between what's going on at local level and what is going on at national mm -hmm. level. Here I think we have a huge opportunity to have more granular data, more timely data, also because cities, uh, some cities are becoming the drivers of the change towards sustainable development. Thanks. Question time for uh, our followers. Uh, the question is, should official statistics provide information on the sustainability of corporate practices? That's the question that we pose and uh, Meanwhile, maybe if someone might have uh, an immediate question, we're going to take just one to, for the panelists here, in case someone is willing to. Please, the gentleman over there, if you could have a, a microphone for the gentleman. interesting uh, presentation they made uh, on, uh, I should say, one of the most important issues of uh, nowadays for statistics. The problem is that for the first time, I don't know, maybe, it's, uh, but it's my opinion, for the first time statisticians 
are sitting together. They, I mean, it was a business to sit together with politicians and to share their opinion about the policies, of course, only to the extent that statisticians may say something on it, representing they, their autonomy, their uh, independence, uh, professional, and on one side, of course, uh, the, the statisticians in themselves. So the question of mine is the following. Are ah, the statisticians occupying the chairs at the table with the politician or not in this issue? Because this is a very important thing. I mean, how to bring together the two parts in order to share the opinion. We may provide data sooner or later qualitative or less qualitative because it depends also on timeliness. And, but the po problem is the following. Are they used or the discussion between the, ton the two parts are only platonic? Thank this you. Is the question. Thank the you. question is very clear and I think it's a very interesting uh, question because we have people here that have had or might have also different hats in their, in their history. <laughs> Please. Maybe I will start uh, indeed uh, uh, in, in my institution, in the Joint Research Center, it's more or less the same thing. So we produce research, we produce evidence, we make it available, and then it's for the policymakers to take it up. So the uptake is up to them, in a way. But it's not enough uh, in these days. And that's why more and more recently we're talking about knowledge and data, statistical, including brokerage. Uh, that's why we started producing, for example, um, uh, data for policy. Uh, fishes, so that we can really put together everything that one policymaker in a, in an area should need to know in order to factor the available evidence into into policy making. So, in a way, we cast the bridge, and uh, I think that at least from the point of view of the Joint Research Center, what we see is that we are more and more requested. We are more and more sitting around the table, though we are just evidence providers and we are not policy shapers. We are indirect kind of policy shapers, but we are sitting in more and more formations, in more and more uh, uh, groups, policy groups that decide on policy options. So the brokerage and maybe active role of those that provide data, including statistical and evidence, is, is crucial. Thanks, Charlene. And Professor, if you want to answer just very, very briefly, please. Very, very and briefly. Uh, it depends on the different countries, of course. But let me ask you one question. How much space uh, uh, do SDGs have uh, in your website? When you produce data, do you link them to SDGs or not? Or SDGs is just one of the many frameworks according to which you produce data. Do you include in uh, your press releases referring, for example, to I don't know, CO2 emission, the icon of the SDG related uh, to that? If you don't do that, of course, uh, you are missing an opportunity to show that you are working for that particular uh, SDG and therefore, when politicians look at your press releases, they don't make the connection. So you see the role of statistical offices, also especially vis-a-vis -vis media and general, generic users and students and so on, can be huge, but this is your choice, your in general. is a, a choice of a statistical office. It doesn't have anything to do with difficult relationships. It's a, an issue of commitment by NSOs to SDG. I think that Arnold said it uh, very finely in uh, his paper. Uh, it's about political commitment and business opportunity or opportunity at large, you know, how to, to, to find and how to marry those two, those two elements together. I think that we can have the results of this question, if it's possible on the screen, uh, so that everyone can have a, a look. Seconds of suspense, as always, before all right, so that's quite interesting. Answers. Yes, statistical offices must contribute to broadening the enterprise visibility perspective. 33%. 33 again, if I see correctly. Uh, yes, but the cost 
and the time involved will likely be very high. 29% no, this falls outside the rent of statistical offices, 4% no, other reasons. Anyone would like to briefly pick up on that? Or not really? Because it's so very nicely widespread that I think <laughs> it's, it's commenced by itself. Okay, we go to uh, almost the final question, I would say, uh, which is on the embedded impact. So it's partially, of course, related to environmental issues and transparency as well, but it goes more into uh, maybe the details. And uh, it's interesting to see, for instance, that uh, when we talk about data, and uh, the first uh, device that actually helped to, to capture data I think on a, in a very visible way was the, the camera. The camera when, they started, when we started to have camera on mobile phones. So we started to, to collect also apart from the GPS following us and track us. Now, do people know how much greenhouse emissions uh, we put in the world while buying a product like this one in the life cycle of, uh, of a phone, for instance, as uh, Charlina was saying before? Uh, how much of this is impacting? Maybe things could be different if people knew that uh, in a phone, 60% of uh, greenhouse gases and emissions are uh, impacting basically on the raw material when we start mining them and you know, all the processes related to that. And someone might want to also be interested in the fact that 30% is the daily maintenance of those devices. And then we have also to think about, you know, getting rid of them, etc. And then we also consider that big companies uh, like Apple, Samsung, etc., they produce new devices every 1.5 years. With all the change that uh, this brings in terms of, uh, of you know, having new devices and, and all the production, this, is this something that could actually change the perception that policymakers would have and also? Social pressure, as uh, Charlina was saying, you know, that is coming up. And so is embodied data, maybe it's not a new panacea, but maybe could help us to, to better consider and position companies and position the work of uh, statistical uh, offices and institutes. I don't know, I think that you have uh, interesting thoughts to, to share with us. Well, I mean, you mentioned it, uh, embodied data is probably the most important aspect when it comes to the environmental dimension of sustainable development. And, um, but I think to, to grasp the, the, the overall consequences, it's needed to, to have a kind of change in approach when we look at the interaction between the economy and the environment. So in ecological economics, there's this framework that um, you have the economy as a subsystem to a much larger and finite and non-growing ecosystem. And this economic subsystem you know, it has a throughput, basically like human beings. It has materials going in, they're kind of digested in the economy, and then these materials leave the economy in terms of uh, emissions and waste. Now, um, basically these emissions and waste obviously have environmental consequences. 70% um, of the output of the economy, of the global economy in 2010 was greenhouse gas emissions. So basically you can see um, there is very strong consequences. So if we want to uh, alleviate these consequences, work on climate change, on biodiversity, and so on, we have to know exactly what the inputs to the economy are, um, not just the quantity, but also the nature of these inputs. And that, this is where the embodied data comes in. Um, uh, basically, on the global level, this is rather straightforward, as difficult as it is, because inputs equal outputs. But of course, on the national level, you have to uh, take into account trade. Um, and basically, uh, yeah. The way we do it currently is that um, we only measure the materials that enter the economy in terms of imports by weight, but we do not take into account the materials that are actually used to produce these products in third countries. So, um, but I hear that Eurostat is working on improving these indicators with the raw material consumption indicator, um, replacing the domestic material consumption indicator. So I think this is a step in the right direction and it shows the importance of embodied indicators. And once we have this data, we can also break this down into, into products, and then consumers can actually see what the consequence of their uh, consumption behavior is. Um, and as such, with better visibility of this data, we can probably also change consumption habits uh, 
sooner or later. At least that's the positive view behind it. Any reaction to that? Embody the Professor Giovannini first and then Margot. Very quickly and then I leave the microphone to the expert. Uh, let me say that uh, this is the point where I do not agree with uh, one of the conclusions in the previous uh, question. And the point is that uh, companies are reporting mostly about uh, their own performances to show that they're doing better than the year before. But the absence of aggregate figures prevents from saying that that company is doing better than the others. And this is the, the game that must start. So if Samsung reduces the impact on carbon footprint or any other type of footprint uh, compared to Apple or vice versa, that is a story. Beside the individual uh, embodied data in, uh, in a specific product. And this is where statistical offices comes into the picture, generating even limited to large enterprises, the type of aggregate data that could push then individual companies to be above the average or below the average, depending on the indicator. Without that, uh, they will keep saying I'm doing better than before but not really, on average, I'm doing better than the others. I'm not at all an expert here. <laughs> I'm talking more as a, just a, as a consumer. And uh, I think that I, I fully agree with, uh, with the, the book responses that you, that you gave. Just to add to that, I think really uh, it's, a, it's, it's a very much bottom-up approach now. And we live uh, in a new reality when the, when the society is much more aware and feeling also responsible that they understand the role in uh, uh, an importance in having a voice in sustainable development. So they would, uh, the customers would actually would request more information, more transparent data on the food, on the on the, the what they, what basically what they what they buy, and uh, and I think what is really important here is to make sure that there is some standardization in data, that uh, that what we uh, that ev that the data comes. That is the data that comes is is, um, mm, is credible because just to give a simple example for the bio food now uh, you go to the to the store you have a bio food but what is the methodology behind what is that they, are they giving us the data that we want to read or are they giving us really transparent picture of what is bio what is not bio right that we know what we are what we are buying so I think it's it's, uh, it's very important that uh, that we know what is the, the framework there we know what is the methodology behind and uh, and and we have have set of data that is credible can gi can give credible picture to drive some some political decisions and uh, and also customer choices and they they, they they trust the data that they have access to. Charlina. Uh, yes, uh, um, actually I, I already <coughs> mentioned about the life cycle approach, which is the systematic approach to assessing the environmental impact, and this is part of the story of the um, of uh, the embodied in environmental data. They give a lot of information. They are part of the picture. We can't skip them simply because they are part of the life cycle of uh, the overall consumption, the assessment at life cycle uh, uh, basis. Uh, sometimes the embodied um, uh, environmental, negative environmental impact is higher than the domestically produced in unit product. So from this point of view, it is crucial to, to take account of this data. Um, what we are doing in the Joint Research Center, uh, we do national accounts together with the uh, Eurostat, and also we have this type of aggregated uh, method, the uh, input and output tables, uh, multi-country for the EU as a whole, because I totally agree with um, Professor Giovannini that we need aggregated data. But then, uh, if we want to assess the impact at various policies and product level, then uh, uh, we need this data uh, in, in sufficient granularity so that we can assess which are the impacts, the highest impacts, so that our policies are effectively targeted. Because uh, if you don't know where the real impact comes from, in all the data, domestic production, which, um, uh, with which reference, then uh, your policies are blind. So in order to target your policies, we really need the full, the full picture. And this is, this is the, 
the critical, the critical mass that they need. And something else that they drink, because consumption is in the end uh, a very good uh, um, uh, kind of a composite uh, um, embodiment of our environmental impact, we do a framework for assessment of uh, uh, the envir environmental impact of consumption. And we've done uh, so for, for example, for sectors like uh, mobility, uh, housing and food. And there's some very interesting data there. If someone, because we don't have the time now, but uh, I really invite you to go to the JRC site and look into that. Uh, it, it's really uh, eye-opening of uh, how we're producing our products, how we consume, and uh, whether we are doing the right policies. Magosh, you want to react to that? I'm sure that you are. And after that, we go for the final, uh, the final voting and the questions. I think there's another key word that was just mentioned here, the full picture. And I think now, again, it's a new reality. There are new partnerships. There are new ways of doing things. There are new impacts on, uh, on uh, uh, well, we need, to have, we need to have a full picture in order to take the right decisions. And, uh, and at the times when we have fragmented data because it was, we were able to, to work in, in, in silos, are over. There are new partnerships, there are new players, they are, they, there's a different role of, uh, of corporates in, uh, in uh, uh, leading to the low carbon economy and, uh, and susta sustainable development. And I think it's very important that we, that we take all that into account and, uh, uh, in order to, to take informed decisions. Thanks. And uh, I will uh, like now to ask uh, people to vote on the question, which is, uh, should statistical offices invest in the collection of embodied environmental data? So that's the, the final question. Then we're going to have a, we're going to see the results. We're going to see the results. And I would like to briefly open the floor because uh, your question is food for thought, but we also have the coffee break. So you have to choose what's the priority here between the access to food and uh, nutrition security or uh, food for thought, so this is in your choice. Anyone, a question in relation, not necessary to uh, the last topic here, or also a reflection from the panelists or an open question from the panelists also to the public, to the, to the peers, to the colleagues here in the, in the room. Please, comment from Professor Durani. If there are no questions, about the question on the full picture. Beside the full picture, we should our, ask ourselves, are we providing the right picture that helps in changing uh, the behaviors at macro level? And this is a fundamental question for national accounts. Is at this point a national account, not only economic accounts, providing uh, the right picture of the unsustainability of sustainability uh, of our economies and societies, with uh, Eurostat and the others try to focus on the measures of different forms of capital. Now we have uh, standard measures of economic capital, some measures of uh, natural capital, especially in uh, physical terms, no agreement on how to measure human capital and we never started uh, yet to measure social capital. Now, the point is that uh, if we, for example, keep measuring uh, education expenditures as a cost and not as an investment, uh, I think that we are creating a bias in the, in the overall discussion on sustainable development. I don't think that there is any plan to revise in depth the national account system, the system of national accounts, but I think that Europe, especially if uh, Europe wants to be the champion of sustainable development, has to do, do an in-depth evaluation on how national accounts, economic accounts, takes into account, uh, sorry for the joke, the different forms of capital uh, for sustainable development. Thank you very much. I would like to see the results, if possible, uh, to have them on the screen. And just for you to know, of course, that uh, after the end of the session, we're going to have the coffee break, where you, uh, of course, are invited also to catch up and uh, discuss with the panelists, those that will be staying uh, also there. You can take advantage of, uh, of this opportunity as well. And later on, when we're going to come back, uh, we're going to have the keynote speech of the distinguished professor Ted Porter, 
uh, which would be about the pursuit of objectivity in science and public life, which is almost close to the pursuit of happiness, I would say, for some of you living in, and working in this context. The results. The results are, yes, it is important that official statistics capture the data. What? 61%, I would say it's quite uh, considerable uh, data here. And 39, maybe, but this has to be weighted against other priorities, as usual. So this room, I guess, <laughs> plus someone else from outside, maybe. All right, if there is really no other no question from the public. I would like to thank uh, the panelists. I think it has been very, very informative and, and useful. And I would like to give, of course, a big round of applause to them and to all of us. Thank you very much.